You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 29th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where we learned this week that the name of Blue Gals Brandeis University garage band, Jewish Space Laser, has been grossly misunderstood by some people. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hey, everybody. Yeah, my my garage band in the early 80s. You know, Jewish space laser. Who knew? Yeah, who well, knew it would it would achieve nationwide fame? And I, I'm dating. I, I'm dating and married to the uh, the lead singer for Jewish space laser, <laughs> which in the '90s I thought was an impossible dream. When I was going to the clubs <laughs> at night and listening to you know the, the whatever, whoever was passing through town, um, never did I dream that I would uh, one day marry the, the non-Jewish. Yeah, that's lead the Irish. singer of Jewish Space Laser. Yeah. <laughs> yes, pretty cool. So uh, the yeah. internet just brings me all the riches. I, I, I couldn't uh-huh. be more grateful. Um, <laughs> Our show this week is brought to you once again by Hello Fascist, the at-home meal kit for Republicans. If you have legitimate reasons for thinking the restaurant kitchen is peeing in your food, try Hello Fascist at-home meal kit. It's like they built a wall around your balsamic pork loin. And they do deliver to the governor's mansion of Arkansas. So, you know, don't, don't you worry, Huckabee Sarah. Sanders, if she wins, if she wins the governor's race in Arkansas, Which she can is, still get her at home meal kit. There's a there's a you know, there's a decent chance that she will. Um, well, because she's Arkansas. a legacy. Yeah. Um, although, you know, um, I mean, the hell of fascist people are going to have to go into sort of high end catering, I think, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. in case you haven't noticed um, the the people who are the more grassrootsy folks, the folks that are in your neighborhood and, and own local businesses, aren't really backing away from the whole fascism thing. They're no, kind they're of not. Really into it. They're kind of like, yeah, that's who we are. This, we've always been this way. And um, that is what is truly surreal about living where we live, Springfield, Illinois. Because, I mean, I participate in local in the local life of the community and municipal stuff in meetings about businesses and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not the mayor because I don't have the hair for it. <laughs> but um, but I, I do participate to the best of my ability. And there is this disorienting sense where you're in a meeting for an hour or an hour and a half talking about uh, business closings and openings and curb cuts. So bars can open little mini parks in front of their places and chamber of commerce marketing and and parking and parking and, and campaigns to bring people downtown because that's really important. And that's the whole agenda. Mm-hmm. And I understand that. And it's it's perfectly valid and true and and critical especially for a town that, you know, to survive, you're going to have to do these things. Mm -hmm. And then you leave that meeting and go to a completely different universe where the news is completely dominated by the shock waves from the January 6th insurrection. Mm -hmm. Everything is a backdrop to that. Everything. There's no conversation about curb cuts or business openings. There's a high level statistics about the economy and whatnot. But Mm -hmm. the, the, the urgency of the conversation is entirely centered around holy shit, the Republican Party really is a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. And they Mm -hmm. really aren't backing away from this. And they're giving the worst people a pat on the back. And the the one or two decent people, and I I certainly wouldn't classify Liz Cheney as decent, but they're they're bashing people who think that insurrection might in fact be an impeachable offense. Um, And 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 it's what the Democrats are going to do, what Republicans are going to do. And is this going to be a removal or, or whatnot? And yet all of this flow is floating on top of the real problem, which is the Republican Party. The modern GOP has always been a white grievance party, mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm. And it is a thing that we as a country refuse to come to terms with because of the moral and and political and, and law enforcement implications. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And we've said this many, many times, and it bears repeating this week especially, that there is a real deep problem in this country with – white nationalism and the sense that white people should be calling the shots no matter how badly they fuck up. And anytime anyone does anything that they don't approve of, that should be canceled out because our grievances take priority, our bullshit grievances that are fed to us by hate radio take precedent over everything else. And there's 70 Mm -hmm. plus million of these people out there and they vote in every election and they're heavily armed 
and they're not coming back. Well, I'm not sure how many of them are heavily armed, but they're not there. A lot of them are OK with people being heavily armed and they've yeah. been brainwashed to believe that they're under attack mm -hmm. as that occurs. And as the the Republican Party is revealed to be that and it's not deniable anymore. Mm -hmm. I've been pleased and impressed with how a lot of people that I didn't think remembered the past actually do. Yeah. And people who have always remembered the past are being given a microphone to say that. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed this week, we're like, oh, wait, do they listen to our podcast? Are they? <laughs> They're definitely on our team of, you know, it is time to remember stuff. And, you know, the the no fair remembering stuff is totally tongue in cheek. We always but we yell it at our TV quite yes, a we bit. <laughs> and we have, we've got merch. Well, I've got merch. I had to make special yeah. size shirts for me. But yeah, no, this is this is what we this is our our through line. This is our, our mission statement, mm -hmm. uh, ironically. Um, yes. And, and yes. this week you saw two examples of that. On happening. the same day I saw on Wednesday, I saw two women on MSNBC talking about remembering the past. <gasps> uh, I know. Nicole Hannah-Jones was on the Joy Reid show, mm -hmm. and she is the woman who began and created and formulated the 1619 Project for the New York Times. So her reason for being is to remember the past accurately. I mean, that yeah. is her, th her brand, right? Mm -hmm. um, but she said, uh, and of course the other guest... Uh, look, you guys don't want us to talk anymore about the Lincoln Project, but I got to tell you, if I'm going to talk about Nicole Hannah Jones, the other person on the Joy Reid show is Steve Schmidt. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to get away from it. Every week I tell you this, Blue Gal, and please uh -huh. take it to heart. I, I really want you to stop talking so much about the Lincoln Project. I know. It's all my fault. <laughs> it's like a, an obsession with you. And I really like an obsession with me. No, it's not. Yeah, just, but. Drift, drift class, you know, this is his thing. And and we have gotten letters like, OK, we we get it. You know, we get it that it's the Lincoln Project. And so we have had a conversation about this. And, and part of me wants to say never complain, never explain. Sure. But I think our relationship with our listeners is such that we can have this conversation with them, which sure. is when the Lincoln Project pops up in another context, I think it's important to talk about it. Well, I, I, uh, having a vendetta against the Lincoln Project and making this the anti-Bulwark show gets a little bit, it, it's too you much. know, it's too much. much. <laughs> and I, will, I would only broaden, I would only appeal to the court um, to say that <laughs> I, need to, I need to broaden out the definition to never Trumpers in the media. Yeah. Because well, they're not all part of the same thing. They're not all part of the same thing. But also, if we only talk about the never Trumper thing that's going on as it pops up in other contexts it yeah. will still be there and you can still rail sure. against it sure and in particular when you have on the formulator of the 1619 project yes and you have to have steve schmidt on at the same time that says something that yeah. says something important <laughs> but here's what nicole hannah jones said she said, it is interesting to watch all the people trying now to separate themselves from the element of the Republican Party that's been the only Republican Party I have ever known. And I'm 44 years old. There's always been an acceptance of that fringe element of that white resentment politics. And that's not saying every Republican is racist, but they certainly were willing to overlook racism or get in bed with a racist. Mm -hmm. to pass whatever larger agenda they were interested in. We shouldn't be surprised about being here. If you look back at the 1960s, the KKK and White Citizens Council, they were after the same thing. And the White Citizens Council got upset when the KKK would get so violent that it would no longer allow that plausible deniability. That's important. Mm -hmm. That's where we are now. What we saw on January 6th, what Donald Trump has done, He's removed the veneer of respectability from a party that has long signaled white resentment. And she went on to mention Ronald Reagan going to Mississippi. Not St. Ronald Reagan. St. Ronald Reagan going to Mississippi and talking to, you know, about young bucks getting welfare, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then Steve Schmidt had to come in and say, well... Well, Not Ronald Reagan. Reagan wasn't like that. No, <laughs> he and, wasn't and, really like that. The hell he was. <laughs> and, and my imitation of Steve Schmidt is no. 
because <laughs> that just fucks everything up. That puts yeah. him. That's but that puts him and all of the fuckers like him smack in the middle of the political party that created Donald Trump, and that is not a place that they want to be. So the other person that was on the same day on Lawrence O'Donnell, Alex Wagner was on, and she said. The fact of the matter is, this is the Republican Party, meaning Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. We keep pretending like Marjorie Taylor Greene is an outlier, like President Trump is an outlier. I don't think it began with Trump. I think Trump is the hothouse flower that bloomed in the fetid environment of conspiracy, of lies, of racism, of violence. We remember the things that were said about President Obama when he was in office. Trump is an expression he is the harvest of those seeds that were sown nearly a decade ago. And now this, I mean, 85 to 91 percent of the Republican Party would pull the lever again for Donald Trump. Uh -huh. The outliers are the Mitt Romneys. I am not sure that they have a place in the Republican Party anymore. The takeover, if you look at this moment, is complete. Mm -hmm. And so here you have two representation matters, right? Mm hmm. Alex Wagner, you said she's she's from the Philippines. I believe she's uh, Filipino or, or partially. I, I, that's uh -huh. that's my understanding. And and uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, clearly African American, having mm -hmm. that representation, those women on television talking about history and what they remember, what they remember about the Republican Party. They mm -hmm. remember the Tea Party. They remember the racism of that. They remember an African lion and a lion African signs yeah. at, at Tea Party rallies. Of course. It was a racist movement. And there's an NPR guy that lost his job because he said that at dinner one time. You know, he said that at a lunch. Chris Hayes had on uh, Chris Steyerwalt last night, Thursday night. And Chris Steyerwalt was the digital political director for Fox News. And his decision desk declared that Biden had won Arizona. Mm -hmm. And they did it the same way they and they determined that Romney lost and that Bush won. And, you know, you count the numbers, you check the returns, you look at them, you count the number of votes and you say, yep, this is the way this state went. And there's no emotion involved with it. You just do it. But Carl, and, Rove, well, Carl Rove would like to raise an objection. And I'm then, not sure exactly. You right. It is the job of the on-camera propagandists to flip out. Um, and so... Or to distract. So Chris Starwalt was just doing the same job he's done in other elections. Count the votes and announce and try to be first. And uh, he got holy hell from Fox News viewers. How dare you declare Arizona for anyone but Trump? Mm -hmm. Because we create our own reality drift class. Right. right. <laughs> and, and he... His his future at Fox News, the days were numbered at that point. Very days were numbered. The days on air were over at uh -huh. that point. He was yep. not allowed on air after that call. And during the month of January, he was let go, laid off. And he's not allowed to talk about his, the conditions by which he left the network, of course, because that's how Fox operates. NDAs, but, baby. NDAs. But he wrote, he wrote an op-ed for the L.A. Times about the conditions of news as I leave Fox, mm -hmm. and it's all about well. Hold on, you know, we're, hold on. We're, I got to get my largest handkerchief out now because I'm about to weep <laughs> just copiously about the state of news in America. State of news in America, mm -hmm. you know, we're not designed to watch news twenty four seven. The problem is with the audience being addicted to watching news all the time. Sure, and our our job as profitable advertising outlets is to keep viewers coming back for more all the time. Yeah, and well, so it's really, you know, it's the system, man. Yeah, the system. Goddamn <laughs> it's the man. The man's trying to keep Chris Steyerwalt down. Yeah, and, and yeah. so here's Chris Hayes looking at him and raising his eyebrows and saying, uh, you know, all that's really good, and you're right about, you know, profit centers and how how we narrow down our audiences so we can sell advertising. But the fact is that, Fox News allowed Donald Trump to lie on the air constantly mm -hmm. and lied for him constantly and tells lies. They have people on the air that tell lies. And Chris Starwood was, well, I didn't tell any lies. It wasn't me. Well, I didn't tell no lies. Look, my job, I, let me be clear. 
my job was to do uh, landscaping at Berchtesgaden, okay? I didn't know nothing about no Nazis, okay? I didn't know nothing about – I swept out some some train cars. That's all I did. I didn't know nothing about yeah. nothing. Yeah. And yeah. really because literally anyone who watches Fox News, which I assume you do as a condition of your employment, knows exactly what a shit pile of lies and fascism and destructive racist um, firewalling – um, your network has been for decades. So right. are you an idiot or are you lying now? Those are your two choices. And he did well, not want to have this conversation. Chris, Chris Steyerwald didn't want to have this conversation, but in the end looked at the camera and said lying to people is wrong. Lying is wrong. And that's all. That's how he could get off the air with Chris Hayes and and walk away. And yet I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in, in his shoes going, you know, I think it would be a really good idea if I went on the air with Chris Hayes. That's <laughs> my a, friend Chris Hayes. My, my yes. good friend, my good friend Chris Hayes. Because we're both Chris. Well, we're both in the news business, and you know, this is a, this is about putting his face mm-hmm. and voice on television so that CNN will hire him. That's oh, yeah. what that's about. Yeah. It's and you have to do it. You write it. Uh, that's how, how it works. You don't apply for a job. You write an op ed for the L.A. Times, and then you go on the interview circuit to talk about your op ed in the L.A. Times. And someone looks at you and says, "Okay, that'll fill a slot in the afternoon." You know, Wait you can do, you can read polls for us, right? Are, are you telling me that representation <laughs> on cable news actually matters when it comes to your credibility <laughs> in your job? career and getting a job? <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah. this is coming coming as a big shock to me. No, it's as not. a person who's been told repeatedly, <laughs> "What does it matter?" You know, there's, why are you getting so worked up about all these people that you know, lie all the time or, or misrepresent the facts? having, you know, millions of dollars in free advertising every day of their lives. I mean, you know, what, are you jealous? Is that the problem? Are you jealous? Is this personal? No, it's not personal. It's, it's in fact, deeply, deeply important to me that we understand why those people are on the air and what they are doing while they're there. Um, but it's also important to recognize and uh, amplify when the right person is on absolutely, the air. And, 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 and we haven't done enough of that and we no. need to do more of it. So we're going to, we're, we stand corrected and we will be doing more of that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the next person I want to talk about is uh, Justin speak. Justin speak is a uh, Reddit GameStop investor. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a story this yeah. was. Yeah. Right. Uh, junior dude is incredibly excited that GameStop is in the news. First of all, cause you know, that's his jam. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fact that they're getting the little guy, the little guys are getting the big guys. And that's, yeah. you know, wonderful for him. So, uh, but Justin Speak was on MSNBC mm-hmm. talking about his experience on Reddit, talking about stocks, because that's his right as an American mm-hmm. to talk about stocks on on a social media platform. Right. Uh, or wherever he can. I mean, it's social media platforms as we have learned painfully are privately owned and people can do with them what they wish uh drift glass is still banned from twitter uh but this guy was on reddit and talking about stocks and uh, the conversation he he was asked by the hostess what uh you know is this is this about revenge is this about economic revenge against hedge fund people and he the conversation went in a place i never thought i would see it go Uh uh-huh he said, I'm a pastor. Uh-oh. And and then he tells the story of Luke 12. And I'm going to read Luke 12 from the message, but he, he, he tells it uh, in his own language. But here's, here's Luke 12. Let's do Bible bitch. Bible bitch. That's not scriptural. Luke 12 is the story of the greedy farmer. Starts with verse 13. Someone out of the crowd said to Jesus... Teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. He replied, Mister, what makes you think it's any of my business to be a judge or mediator for you? Speaking to the people, he went on, Take care, protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in all my grain and goods. And I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. 
you've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then, God showed up and said, fool, tonight you die and your barn full of goods. Who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. And uh, this young man, Justin Speak, said, pastor, with pastor, these, yeah. pastor yep. said, with these hedge fund managers, their life was demanded of them that night. They had to make a decision, cash in or lose all their money. And, uh, you know, tough. They, they could have made the world a better place with that money, and they decided to flush it on, in a hedge fund. Well, they, they went on building bigger barns. That's what they do. That's they, what they, they did. I need exactly. to acquire more shit. Why? Because that's what I do. I'm an, I'm an acquisitive machine. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. what about, the, you know, you've, you've hoarded billions of dollars of wealth for no real productive reason other than you play a little game that you've rigged so that you'll always win. Right. And right. these guys hacked the game. And suddenly it's an outrage. It's an outrage. And how dare you mess with the markets? Right. (laughs) Right. As if somehow you're entitled to a profit if you have a billion dollars. Whereas if you have, you know, $530 and you put that in to to invest in a company rather than to bet on it failing. Right. That's what gets me is this shorting stock and betting. It's just. It's Vegas, right? You should, well, yeah. you should go do that in Las Vegas. That's well, what this, you should do. This reminds me of the scene in the big short. I'm not sure yeah. who all the actors Everybody. were, but where, <laughs> where, where this guy is explaining how this works. You know, we, we sell you a shit stock that we know is shit and we know is going to fail. And then we go take out an insurance policy on you getting killed. Mm-hmm. And we win, uh, we win both ways. We win by selling you shit we know is worthless. And when your system collapses, we we collect on the insurance that we we bought betting the insur- that your system would collapse and the the people who are listening are dumbfounded that yeah. wait a minute yeah. you mean like this is intentional the whole thing mm-hmm. is intended to collapse and you don't really give a shit it's like yeah i'll mm-hmm. be out mm-hmm. you know i'll i be why was it i be i be g y b g i'll be gone you'll be gone yeah who cares right. if we leave a smoking hole in the ground where the economy used to be i'll have um, uh, several houses and uh, several boats and a private plane that's all that matters. And I win. And I yes. win. Yes. And it's that kind of stag- that 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 realization. And this is is sort of what is happening to the country politically. The mm-hmm. realization that these masters of the universe are monsters. Yeah. They're fucking monsters. The the, the person next door who owns a, a, an armory and talked about Barack Obama being a, a Kenyan monster mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. a monster. Yeah, he really is. And he's not kidding. And there are millions like him in the country. And there's this dawning realization that, holy shit, we have a real problem. These are not a couple of crackpots running around the woods, you know, with paintballs. Mm-hmm. These are real, you know, these are millions of Americans who are like, nope, either I get the government I want, either I get what I want, you know, and, and if I lose the election, it's impossible because we're the majority. So we'll have to take it back by force. And the problem. Well, and I, I like the I like the person on Twitter who said our our current political situation is more easily understood if we understand we're in the middle of a 12 and a half year recession. Yes, we are. And we're in the middle of the, we're in the 40th year of the Reagan revolution. And we're in the 40th year of the Reagan revolution. And I want to bring this back home to Springfield, Illinois for a moment, if you'll sure. indulge me. Absolutely. Your there, podcast, was a letter, baby. there was a letter to the editor in the Wednesday uh, State Journal Register. Very short letter, but it got my <laughs> Irish up. <laughs> The, the title that the op-ed page gave to this letter is, Why Give COVID-19 Shots to Outsiders? Yes. Speaking of greed, uh, I have a question on the article Sunday, on Sunday about not having enough COVID vaccine to immunize anyone under 85. And I'll just provide background. Illinois was going to start immunizing people 65 and up, and they had to change it to 85 and up because... We don't have enough vaccine, and that's where we currently are. And fortunately, our governor's been really transparent about that, that the right now, 85 and up, and if you're 65 and you bring your 85-year-old parent in, you can get a vaccine at the same time as your parent right? because it's understood that you probably have to transport that person. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's 85 and up right now in Illinois. And uh, so 
not having enough COVID vaccine to immunize anyone under 85, but accepting anyone from outside of Sangamon County, as well as county residents. If there isn't enough vaccine for our county residents over 65, why are we going to vaccinate anyone over 85 from outside of our county? Yeah. I can't. (laughs) I and which church do you go to, lady? Right. And which church do you go to? Uh And and you know, this is we had snow and ice and visibility issues and People are driving in these conditions to get into town That because we're surrounded, as I've said, by cornfields. Yes. real And people are coming to Sangamon County because Springfield, Illinois is in Sangamon County. And that's where there is a grocery store with a big enough freezer to hold the vaccines Mm -hmm. and keep them fresh. And here are people driving in these conditions to get into their appointment to get their 85-year-old parent a shot, and you have time, sorry, bitch, you have time to write a letter to the editor like that because your 66-year-old privileged ass is bored. Now that Donald Trump is no longer in office, all of the media people, all the sort of big media companies are returning to their default settings, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially the goddamn New York Times. Seriously. Um. This week and this week alone, because uh, this is just going to go on forever. This 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 week, the New York Times returned to its magic ruralism, which is where you send a reporter out to basically where I live, not to talk to me or my wife or anyone I know, but to talk to Trump supporters who think that they've been robbed and 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 impeachment was bullshit and blah blah blah, all the same shit that you've been reading in the New York Times and the Washington Post for four years. Because really what's important to know is to find out what Trump supporters, Republicans like that, feel. It's very important that we find out what they feel. And no, it's really not. But that's what the New York Times has decided it wants to do. And I thought, well, you know, with Trump gone, we're going to, oh, I guess, no, this is going to be with us forever. Fine. At least both siderism is dead, right? I mean, nope. four years of Trump must have killed this shit. Nope. Not, At the not, New York Times? No way. No. Uh, at the New York Times this week, we had two editorials. One, I believe, from the editorial board saying, you know, Joe Biden's going a little bit too far with this whole executive order thing. Too you many. Know, uh, too many. Very upset. You know, it's going to upset the unity. And, you know, it, 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 it shows bad faith. And Susan Collins is deeply concerned <laughs> about it. And really, let's not go too far. I mean, you know, maybe four years of Caligula in excess was bad. But trying to undo some of it. Uh, quickly as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. Yes. that's excessive too why aren't you courting marjorie taylor green's good opinion because then you yeah. can have the unity and like this is from people who've never fucking left manhattan yeah and have yeah. never ever seen a real actual person of the republican persuasion out in the wild they just and they're never going to they mm-hmm. live in a cocoon and they write for themselves and they jerk off for themselves and the reason it works is because they're the new york times and of course, bringing up the rear is Mr. David Brooks, um, who we I have three sentences about David Brooks in our notes, and I, I, I totally approve of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, David Brooks thinks schools should be reopened now, 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 and that liberal teachers unions, liberal teachers unions. The article is like, you know, conservatives can be stinky, but liberals can be stinky too. Well, what is well, the liberal teachers unions are the selfish bastards who are objecting to opening schools immediately. And by the way. Black Lives Matters uh, activists don't really care that much about children of color because if they did, they insist that we open schools now. And I just I was like, you have got to be shitting me because this is a guy who if you've watched him on PBS because he's got his own show, his own segment on, on television every night, every Friday night is sitting in front of his color-coded, creepy, sociopathic bookcase at home, where Mm -hmm. he's been since May. Because you know what? The PBS people think it's too dangerous for David Brooks to leave his hermetically sealed mansion in Lincoln Park and go in and be in a studio with a bunch of people who might make him sick. Mm -hmm. And from his hermetically sealed mansion, he wrote an article about how kids should be crammed back into the classroom immediately, because that's really important. And I couldn't fucking believe it and i i was i wrote a post about it i said look my mom was a teacher my dad was a teacher my sister when people get divorced they remarry teachers my brother works in a senior extended care facility where everyone's tested many times a week because if that virus gets in there it'll ravage the place right and even and, though and they, people will die immediately they will yeah. 
And even though they were really careful, the president, the head of the organization caught it because his wife was out somewhere where somebody wasn't 100% um, uh, mask disciplined. Yeah. So he had to go into lockdown. They're really, really careful. And this jag off in New York decides he's going to write about what he thinks should should be national virus policy and school policy because he lives in a hermetically sealed bubble where he's perfectly safe all the time. Well, and let's be clear, he's a he's a white guy he's with a, a white platform I'm that a privileged white man. The New York the New York Times thinks he should have. And this this centering of white maleness is oh, the God. problem. It is. And I, um, I was going to write some very angry things, but the ratio got there first. Um <laughs> I'm sure it like, did. It's just like, <laughs> holy shit, man. I, and, the, and the ones that I liked the most were like, you know, normally I like your columns, but this is insane. What the yeah. hell is wrong with you? What BLM activists don't care about African-American children? children? Are you fucking they, kidding me? Because they won't take your side against teachers unions trying to keep their their, their members safe. And it's because mm. uh, somebody and somewhere. And their students safe. Yeah. Well, and their yeah. students safe. And their students safe um, from bringing the virus home to granny. Right. You know, it right. just it, it it and we're 10 months into this and he's just like, ah, fuck it. You know, I, I live in a completely separate white privilege universe where this all this makes sense to me. And most importantly, there will be no consequences for me right. writing crazy. And I like can, this. as I always have, move people around my chessboard. Right. And it's not actual human beings in my mind that are being affected. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, speaking want- of that, uh-huh. we're going to switch gears to Lou Dobbs for a oh, moment. Oh, please go, go. Go right ahead. Who, who, let's not forget, in the for the past four years has deified Donald Trump. He has as the savior of America. I have a theory about Lou Dobbs, but it's that he's he's the portrait Tucker Carlson hangs in his closet, like Dorian Gray. Lou yeah. Dobbs is the doddering old lunatic who Tucker Carlson will be in a few years. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, he he wanted to talk about racism, Drift Glass. That's that's always exciting. <laughs> Grandpa, and he tell, said, me, tell me more about Grandpa, the colors, Grandpa, Grandpa. Grandpa Lou Dobbs says. Yeah, oh, God. You know, it's such an absurd idea of systemic racism in any expression. And why is what, you know, it's it's just racism. It's racism itself. I don't understand the word. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. That's the, that's the truest thing you've said all night, Lou Dobbs. <laughs> I don't understand the word. Why the word systemic has to be in it. Other than to really support the idea that we need some giant vast system to deal with it, mm-hmm. which clearly we don't. We just simply need to be our better selves. Yeah. Hey, Lou, <laughs> this this is my better self. This Trust is my me. better self right here. <laughs> this is this is my better self, Lou. You don't want to see my not better self. No, um, no. And and, and uh yeah. Ten million this, bucks this, a year Lou Dobbs makes yeah. to say that to old white people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because they uh, it's not it's not hear. systemic racism. There's no systemic racism. We just need to be better people and be our best selves. Be your best. Yeah. Be best. Be best. All right. Know. Yeah. Now so uh PBS Frontline had a <clears> one hour, <throat> it's on YouTube now, one hour did. documentary. Did I called you, you did you watch the whole thing? I did. Oh, I, t- wow. I took You're notes. stronger than I am. I, I, I live blogged it. Uh, I live tweeted it without <laughs> Twitter. I just sat there taking notes going, okay, this and this. Because I, I assume most it, of the people. It was called Trump's American Carnage. Trump's American Carnage. And it's the right. same guy. Uh, William Lyman is the is the uh, voiceover guy who is also the guy who does um, Dos Equis beer. Cool. So that's why Dos Equis beer always has that that whiff of credibility around it. Because it's that voice, you know. Do, 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 do. Um, so he's he. So that's the that's the voice of my omniscience. And if you've ever watched a frontline documentary of any kind, they're all sort of the same. That's why I, I could feel when the beats were coming. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have mm-hmm. a bit of file footage, and we have a reporter, and we have a file footage, and we have a reporter, and then we're going to have an expert in the field, and then we're going to have William Lyman, and that's when things turn bad. Uh-huh. Um, and that's uh-huh. how things go. So I and, watched and the, that's not a bad framework on know. which to tell a story. No. It really isn't. And I, frontline I, does a very good job most of the time. Absolutely. Of telling a story. And I, right. I, I fully accept the fact I, there's no beef from me. This was this was upfront. This is going to be this is going to be how Donald Trump um, went from the guy in, on the escalator to the guy leading an insurrection. Right. And that's fine. How right. did we get here? That's, exactly. That is here? the point. Right. So right. like the entire pandemic has given 30 seconds are given to the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the pandemic is mostly used as a device to say 
Donald Trump then went on to say, liberate Virginia, liberate Michigan. Mm-hmm. And violent mm-hmm. mobs showed up and try and tried to execute on the policy. And tried to kidnap to the governor. Right, right. So the pandemic was a means to describe what their story was really going to be, which is about Donald Trump and the Republican Party being this. Inciting in, riots. Inciting yeah. riots. And I have yeah. no problem with that. It, you know, this was not a 20 hour disquisition on every horrible thing Donald Trump ever did. This was a one hour on how we got from here to there. I understand mm-hmm. that. Um, what I had a problem with, with real, a real problem with, was, were the people seated in chairs. In every frontline documentary, there are people seated in chairs, and there's various people who come on and do things and talk about things. And there's going to be some photographs and video footage and audio recordings and tweets and documents, and then these people will react to them, and talk about them. Now there were reporters, and I. That's great. They had Yamiche Alcindor, and she's terrific, and Peter Baker, who's not terrific, and Darlene Supervale, and Robert Costa, and so on and so forth, talking about the relevant stories they've reported on. So Yamiche Alcindor talked about when they cleared Lafayette Square, and Mm -hmm. she started getting tears in her eyes, and she couldn't figure out why, and it was the tear gas. And she was Mm -hmm. right there, and they showed a lot of footage. Um, The clearing of Lafayette Park got a lot more footage than the entire pandemic, which I think is Mm -hmm. fair, given the story they're trying to tell. Right, right. And then they brought on the villains. They brought on Corey Lewandowski and Roger Stone and Sean Spicer. And Frank Luntz was hilarious trying to look like he regretted all of this. It was all very regretful and sad. Uh, Because, you know, if you're telling the story, it's only fair you hear from the bad guys. And these were bad guys. Corey Lewandowski is a monster. And and Roger Stone is is scum. And they got him on tape. And that's great for future generations. Then there were a few Republican political eunuchs. You know, um, the current office holding potted ferns like Susan Collins, who are useless, you know, room fillers. And then people who are driven from office like Jeff Flake and Bob Corker, who shake their head days that the party of St. Ronald Reagan um, had come to this. That St. Ronald Reagan didn't come down from Republican heaven and put a stop to all of this. They're just all mm-hmm. shocked that this ever happened. But the most important person in this documentary, from my point of view, was who is the avatar for the audience? Who's the everyman? Who's the person who's going to sit there being outraged that this is happening? How are this, these sons of bitches and blah, 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 blah. And who's the everyman that they chose to talk in as a voice of the American people to say they were warned over and over again. They didn't listen. They didn't listen. And now here we are. Charlie Sykes of the Bulwark. Yep. And Charlie Sykes of the Bulwark got as much time as Donald Trump in this wow. in terms of voice time. Um, wow. And what we learned, uh, if you weren't familiar with American political history, what you learned were a few things. First, there is no Democratic Party at all. There were no Democrats. I know, in the right? World. Like the Biden voter doesn't is just does not you, exist in media. You, you, there's there's a woman. Uh, you hear the voice of a woman calling for an impeachment vote in the House. There's no mention that her name is Nancy Pelosi. Or what became of that vote? It's just a woman's voice saying, and now we're calling the question of impeachment. And that's it. And then they have uh, Adam Schiff, bless his heart. They have file footage of him as just as part of the story saying, if you let him off the hook now, he'll do it again. Mm -hmm. He'll absolutely do it again, which is 100% true. But other than that, there is no Democratic Party at all. Uh, There's no Women's March. There's no resistance. There's no massive voter registration. There's no unprecedented voter turnout. In 2018, which is the only reason there was an impeachment at all. Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm, integral to the story to understand the Democrats saved this country. And the Democratic Party and all their activists simply do not exist as far as Frontline is concerned. Um, That's what I've been so grateful about Jen Psaki this week. mm -hmm. Because she keeps bringing up two things. One is the agenda that we're pushing is to help every American get over this virus and to get our economy beyond it. Damn it's right. not just for Biden voters. It's for Americans. And then the other thing she points out is there are 81 million Biden voters out there <laughs> yep. who also have feelings. They have Thank big you. Feelings. Well, and, and, and if you, again, if you don't know anything about American politics or you're not really deeply involved, mm-hmm. if you're a history student 10 years from now, looking at the frontline documentary series, you will learn three things from this documentary. All mm-hmm. the scary shit that goes on in the Republican Party, the racism, the lies, the violence, all began with Donald Trump running right. for president. Oh, yeah. No yeah. need to look for any pre-existing conditions any further back than that. That's when all of it started. Second, this entire period of American history, all of it, is defined solely by an internecine struggle between various conservative groups. Mm-hmm. Nothing, that's of it. It, 
Nothing of any real importance to the story of Donald Trump happens outside of Republican world. Well, I'm then, and who were the Republicans sitting around the table during the health care debate, setting up health care for the nation? They were all white men. Exactly. This is the centering of the white male voice. Well, and and last but not least, and I'm agreeing 100 percent with you, the only opposition, real opposition, Donald Trump ever faced came from a small group of plucky never-Trumpers. White men, Who yes. warned their fellow Republicans, and I'm quoting over and over and over again about Donald Trump, who he was, what he was capable of doing, and they looked the other way. Those and the women are just people. bulldozed out of this picture. No Black women. women are bulldozed out of this picture. No women, yep. no people of color, no Democrats, no liberals, nothing. This entire story is encapsulated by a battle between two factions of apparently the only political party in America – and and the ones who are brilliant and correct are the never Trumpers, are are the Bulwark and the Lincoln Project, and everyone else can go you know can go suck it, and that's so, all you yeah. learn from this thing. And I was and I wrote it and I published it and I got some feedback going, yep, <laughs> this is just and awesome. and this is this is the thing that we need to do better on the Professional Left podcast, uh -huh. which is we're good at describing how those folks are erasing us, and we're not so good at drawing us back in. And so I want to make sure our podcast draws us back in. Mm -hmm. We are Democrats. We are here. We've done some things. We've yep. taken back the House and the Senate, yeah. taken back the White House. We did that. Democrats did that. Democrats, Democrats did that. The Lincoln Project and did not do that. Democrats that. No, they did not do that. The Democrats did that. And women activists did that. Absolutely. Stacey Abrams did that. Mm -hmm. Georgia is blue. <laughs> It's very, very light blue, but it's – I never thought – I never thought this would happen. It is a, yeah. it is a minor miracle of democracy that, that Georgia is now blue. And we're going to do it again. We're yes, going we to are. do it again. And the, the way we do it is the way we've always done it, which is organize, 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 mm -hmm. vote, 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 and don't forget the past. Don't mm -hmm. pretend these people are your friends. Don't pretend that your allies – um, if you're if you're my ally, you will tell me the truth. You won't lie about running the Republican Party as a as a generous, wide open, multicultural experiment in democracy when you goddamn well know that's not what happened. And if you're my ally and you're sitting next to them, you're going to say that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. That's not true. You're going to say, you know what? This is as Nicole Hannah Jones said on set with Steve Schmidt next to her. This is the Republican Party I've known my whole life. Mm -hmm. That is a true thing. Now, maybe I'm willing to I'm willing to believe that maybe people like Steve Schmidt never noticed the racism, never noticed the craziness, uh, because he's a because he's a white, white guy. guy. Yeah, and yeah. and this is um, this is what happened to Kathleen Parker. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when yep. she she was perfectly happy with the crazies attacking liberals, mm -hmm. and was was never had a problem with that. That was great. It was part of my team. Then she said one mean thing about Sarah Palin, and the crazy showed up at her door, and she it was like, "Holy shit, where do these people come from?" Well, those are your people. They've and those are the people that have been attacking us all along yeah. and making black people feel really, really afraid to go vote. Well, and this is where um, and I, I want to move on to one other topic. I have been listening to our conservative allies on their podcast and on their publications. Their plan to take back some of the people who are Trump Republicans, try to try to free them from the grip of Trump Republicanism. And I appreciate their efforts. They want to coax them back to Carly Fiorina Republicanism. <laughs> which I have a real problem with. Um, <laughs> and the idea is, you know, you, you, th these people are never going to uh, respond if you're not a trusted source mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because you can trust me. Now, here's the problem. You all built a monster machine with no off switch. You taught them not to believe anyone who told them anything they didn't want to believe. That's why they don't believe right. the New York Times, the Washington Post, or anything liberals say. And, and I'm that. sorry to interrupt you, but that's why they will switch to another source Absolutely. of news if it if they don't agree with it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and there's some recognition that that's going to be the case for the bulk of them. But there might be some who – you can trust me. I'm a conservative. You're a conservative. And I, I, you, we're the same guy. We're the same person. You can trust me. And the reason you can trust me – and this is a through line with all of their – arguments is I'm 100% against abortion. I'm pro-guns. I love America and think it should be defended. Now think of how ridiculous that sounds to a liberal. Mm -hmm. You created a monster machine and trained them not to listen to anyone who tells them stuff they don't want to hear. That's on you. And by your definition, a good conservative, the good conservative vocabulary is the main reason we're in the mess to begin with. A good conservative 
believes that liberals are baby killers. Mm -hmm. A good conservative believes that liberals want to take all their guns away from them so Barack Obama can come make their kids gay. Mm -hmm. A good conservative believes liberals hate America and don't want to defend it at all, that liberals are monsters and evil. That's been your native language for my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. So right, right. the reason there was such a fertile hothouse environment waiting for Donald Trump is because – As Alex Wagner said. As, as yes. Alex Wagner said, is because you built a, a, an ecosystem out of Newt Gingrich politics and mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh vocabulary where it is simply normal to you to shit on people like me and call right. us terrible things and imply that we're monsters. And this was Carly Fiorina, the good Republican, during the Republican primaries in 2016. Her big right. thing was Running Planned, against Parenthood, Trump. Planned Parenthood is chopping up babies and selling them for parts for cash because that's just how liberals are. And she's the good one. She's the one you mm -hmm. want to go back to. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, if you want to go back to Eisenhower Republicanism, I'm on board. But I don't want don't to forget. Don't forget how badly she cheated all through the primary season yeah. on her campaign funding. But we don't want to remember that because that no. makes all the white guys look really stupid and wrong. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And this is why liberals aren't showing up in this conversation among conservatives to say things like this because we'll point out, you know, we really don't appreciate that the reason – the way you're planning to get these people back is say like, we can all agree that liberals are monsters. Because if you created a system where in their brain you've told them for 40 years liberals are baby-killing monsters and devils, therefore dot, dot, dot. Well, what do you mm -hmm. think they're going to fill in the, the blank with? We're going to vote for Mitt Romney? No. No. We're going to vote for – we're going to vote for – no. Jeb Bush? No. Because by that logic, you have completely failed them by not destroying us all these years. So they need to take up arms, right? They, they, have, no. they have to if we're baby to. killer, you know, pizza parlor, as I said on Twitter today. Pizza parlor torture machines, baby tortures, what? and also you know we've got those uh, space lasers, drift glass, well, Jewish space lasers, and you know the Jewish space lasers. So we're, we're keeping those in reserve. But you've created a system where if you try to convince these people to compromise with people like me, they're going to come after you because you've told them for decades that people like me are terrible monsters and you should never cooperate with them. You can never trust them because they want to destroy America. This is the fruit of your. Of your sowing, this is this is right. your harvest. You built this, and and so even the best plan among the most reasonable conservatives involves somehow tricking people into believing that you know we can still shit all over liberals, and we can still mm -hmm. be racist, and we can still be white supremacists. We just can't be armed racist. We can't be armed white supremacists. That's going too far. Well, then you're you're opening the door to these terrible people being elected sometimes, like Joe Biden. Joe Biden, the dirty <laughs> communist. You know, the Biden. total socialist who's doing too many executive orders. And, and he might uh, executive order you. You know that might. drift class. Well, and and there, this all came to a head just just today or yesterday when Rudy Giuliani was on Steve Bannon's podcast. Oh God! With Bron now, we are really we are really going down into the sewer for you folks now. Oh, wait, I want a, you to understand. And this is you should you should feel delighted when we were, when we were excuse me you should be delighted when you report this because this should make you laugh. It makes me laugh because like, Steve Bannon was the second most powerful man in this country for a while, and now he's got his own podcast and he's interviewing Rudy Giuliani with bronzer randomly smeared on his face because that fools everybody um and Gi giuliani's sitting there claiming you know the real insiders of the insurrection were antifa and a guy <laughs> who works for the lincoln project and 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 he used to work for romney but i can't tell you who it is because of anonymous sources and and he and giuliani's got this whole completely paranoid batshit rap about how the Antifa guys were there and this guy from the Lincoln Project, he worked I, with them. I am, I am convinced that you were right last week, Dirk Les. He's going for an insanity defense. Yeah, this is, I'm, I'm as crazy. And Steve Bannon is doing his best the Sandlot. You're killing me here, Rudy. You're killing me. <laughs> You're killing me. And, and Steve Bannon is saying, this is why people don't believe us. <laughs> Because you're yeah. saying that shit crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Between the two of you, you're pointing at Rudy going, no, he's the crazy one. No, you're all the problem. You have your own news network now. And he's got his own fucking podcast now. And you're talking mm -hmm. to each other as if you weren't both mental uh, escape mental patients, which you are. And, and the reason people don't trust you, Steve Bannon, is because you're Steve Bannon. And you represent a party that lies, as Chris Hayes pointed out, just lies all the time. Uh-huh. And, and and hiding behind a business model that you have to do this because you're, you know, they won't buy dick pills and reverse mortgages if you don't, is 
is the worst kind of cowardice because it's acknowledging that what you're doing is terribly destructive, but you don't care because it pays the mortgage. And that is the end of my rant. All right. Let's tell some good news to people. Yeah. All right. Uh, the House formally delivered articles of impeachment against Donald Trump to the Senate this week. Yes, they did. And yes, the Senate is trying to run out the attention clock yeah. so that we don't think Trump was so bad that it, we have to do all this. Why are we wasting our time with this? We're wasting our time with this because we don't ever want this to happen again, ever. And we know you'll do it again. Unless and we, we know you'll do it again, fuckers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Biden care. Biden signed two executive actions to expand ex- access to reproductive health care and ex- also expand health insurance through the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid. There's, quote, there's nothing new that we're doing here other than restoring the Affordable Care Act and restoring Medicaid to the way it was before Trump became president, Biden said. Because by fiat, he changed, made it more inaccessible, more expensive, and more difficult for people to qualify for either of these two plans. Mm-hmm. Biden will try to strengthen protections for people with medical conditions. He will also create a new three-month sign-up period for Obamacare starting next month, aimed partly at people who lost their jobs during the pandemic. The most recent sign-up period was in the fall, and uh, Donald Trump did not promote the sign-up period ever. Oh, he sabotaged it. Um, yeah. So now we're going to, once again, promote signing up for health insurance through advertising emails and other outreach. Uh, Donald Trump didn't bring health care that was so easy, Drift Glass, and, no. and a fraction of the cost uh, of that horrible Obamacare. Actually, the uninsured rate probably rose close to 10% mm-hmm. during Trump's uh, golfing party. Mm -hmm. Uh, I refuse to call it a presidency. Um, Through executive action, Biden may be able to reduce it to about 8% over the next four years. Now, Uh, can Biden go much bigger, you ask? I'll I'll leave that to you. Well, that's that's a good question. Can he go a lot, lot bigger? And and there's a a journalist named Jonathan Cole who does healthcare uh, journalism for a long time. Who who puts out two competing realities, both of which are true, which both which make people very angry Mm -hmm. because both are true at the same time. The first is the Affordable Care Act is very flawed, distressingly compromised, woefully incomplete attempt to establish a basic right that already exists. True. And in every other developed country has a healthcare system that's better than ours. Also Mm -hmm. true. It is also the most ambitious and significant piece of domestic legislation in the past half century. And I would argue, except for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, there is no other bill that was as big and changed changed the world. You know, the the Medicare Act in in the 60s also. Yeah, but uh, absolutely, the idea that we have to do this in fits and starts is really uh, aggravating. It's it's maddening, especially when you know what the right answer is. You know what the right answer is. It's Medicare for all. It's a public option. It's single payer. You know, pick whatever one you like. The question. Well, and that that is the other thing that I think people who do Medicare for all aren't paying attention to is how do other countries administer it? And it's yeah. not all just a Medicare for all system. Different no. countries get to universal coverage different ways. And we need to look at all of those. Rahm Emanuel wrote a whole book about it, about how different countries do it and what might work for us and what might not. But smart people need to be thinking about this and we have the administration to do it. Let's do it. I'm pretty sure it was Rahm Emanuel's brother. Oh, I'm sorry. It was Ron Manuel's brother. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> Ron Manuel's the evil brother and his doctor. He's his the evil brother and his, his brother's brother. the doctor. That's <clears throat> right. Uh, in other good news, General Motors says it will sell only electric vehicles by 2035, phasing out gas-powered pickup trucks and SUVs that today earn billions for the company. Well, and this this is the other thing, the big climate change uh, EOs that came out this yeah. week. And the climate, I mean, I, I use that term ironically, the the Political climate has changed so dramatically that automobile companies are on board. And it's really interesting when you start talking about jobs and government contracts and you make the Green New Deal a jobs bill, how corporations want to be on board with that. They want government contracts to build things. Well, And And we're going to – and I loved how Joe Biden said union jobs. (laughs) Just so we're clear. And and this was always the pitch that when I worked in this – for the city and we were pitching – uh, uh, public-private partnerships to to mm-hmm. do manufacturing training. These are union jobs we are creating. These mm-hmm. are going to be good union jobs that will will prop up the labor union. They'll pay and, well. 
they'll pay have well good and, benefits and they'll keep your company from going under because you need right. these people and it's, it was such an ob- obviously logical solution to a lot of different problems it doesn't solve everything yeah. but it solves a bunch of stuff and it looks like the biden administration has learned from the uh, uh the obama administration because they're yeah. not interested in passing things piecemeal yeah. They are looking yeah. to get um, the 1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package through budget reconciliation. And Jen Psaki, the the new and delightful uh, spokesperson, said that uh, they'd ruled out splitting up the package, saying Biden administration is not going to do this in a piecemeal way or break apart a big package meant to ex- uh, address the crisis we're facing because they know that it's the death of a thousand cuts that right. Republicans have in their back pocket to kill everything they want to try. They want to go, nope. Here's the package. We're going to put it through in reconciliation. Fuck you if you don't like it. And you, and you can take your unity. I got your, your unity right here. Got it right here. Why don't you get up and kiss my unity? By the way, uh, thank you, Twitter. The um, time when the president's press secretary takes down a reporter is now known as a sake bomb. <laughs> just, just, and we're uh, all going to be drinking that. Let uh-huh. me tell you. Uh, House and Senate Democrats also introduced legislation that would make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. Yay! They also introduced right. the the raise the wage act, which would gradually increase the minimum wage to fifteen bucks, and a bunch of other cool stuff. There's just a lot of good stuff that it's finally it's the dam bursting. It's the Biden yeah. administration has a long list of things that it's trying to do fast, fast, fast because that's the only way things get done. Democrats have a whole stack of bills that are are wonderful, and one of the things that's happening right below the surface that Rick Perlstein talks about on Twitter is. A lot of the, the Obama of uh, the Biden administration is filling up with people who are who think centrism is morally bankrupt yep. and who understand yep. workers rights and are pro labor. And, and you don't notice it right away because a lot of other stuff like impeachment is happening. But there's all these like friends of the left. that are showing up in important mm-hmm. positions. They're like and there's a lot okay. of age diversity in yeah. the in the cabinet and in the administration that uh, these younger people that are coming on board, along with people like Andy Slavitt. You know, who's Man. the old Obamacare architect, right? Yeah. And, oh, we can do more? Okay. And here is a seasoned, experienced veteran of the Obamacare fight mm-hmm. coming on board and bringing his experience and backing him up are young people who want more. Yeah. And you you work it out. You Having that richness of talent We'll get stuff done, and I'm, I'm gonna, so excited about I'm going to risk being a little bit hopeful, Blue Gal. Yeah, I'm going to risk being a little bit hopeful, too. But each Even week, though there's a violent lunatic named Marjorie Taylor Greene who needs to be kicked out of the Congress. She really does. All right. We, we, we gave her as much attention as she deserves. Yes. End of story. Period. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week, we have Internet Corgis. Oh, Uh-oh. they're so cute. Uh-oh. Yeah. Sadie Lou, Molly Mae, and Winnie. And here's the interesting thing. There is a young LGBTQ young adult author illustrator named Sassafras Lowry, and she created a coloring book of pets during the COVID lockdown called Pandemic Pets Coloring Book. It's for sale on Amazon. Pandemic Pets Coloring Book, it's called. And I looked through it. It, it looks like it was really well done. And this week's Internet Corgis, Winnie, Sadie Lou, and Molly May submitted their photo, and they were chosen to be in the coloring book. We've hit the big time, Blue Gal. Yeah. yeah. And Sassafras Lowry writes uh, on her book blurb, I think we can all agree that the heroes of social distancing and quarantine have been our beloved pets. They have kept us company in our homes, made us smile, and brightened an uncertain time. To celebrate the love our pets have given us during the pandemic, this coloring book brings 90 pages of coloring fun featuring pets from around the United States, including Sadie Lou, Molly Mae, and Winnie, this week's Internet Corgis. And of course, the three Internet Corgis eat freshly poured dog food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your pets will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Sadie Lou, Molly Mae, and Winnie. Oh, they're so adorable. At our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. 
Be aware, if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag Save the Post Office. By the way, we know we have been uh, made aware this week that the cost of our P.O. box is going up uh, about 20%. So... If you have never donated to the podcast before <laughs> and you want to help us out to keep our post office box going, you'll also be obviously helping our local post office. Uh-huh. Uh, feel free to donate to the podcast. Keep, keep that tiny metal door open. Keep that tiny metal door open. Mm-hmm. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, ProLeftPod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, all of it is there at ProLeftPod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties love Alan Tudyk's new TV show, Resident Alien, but are hoping to see a lot more heroic cats worked into the plot. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.